So thank you so much, Kim, for that really kind introduction. I am indeed extremely excited to be uh, starting a neurosurgical career starting in July, and even more excited to be evolving in PowerPoint since technology is increasingly important in medicine, uh, as, uh, as you'll see over the course of this hour and throughout the course of this, this entire uh, graduate course. So today we're going to be talking about entrepreneurship in medicine. Um, how do we foster uh, an environment that really lets people take risks, use their imagination, think big, and um, not be daunted by any challenge. So first though, I want to start off with the slide behind me. Um, it might not be obvious as to what this is, but I'm sure that many of you, especially if you're a science fiction fan, have heard of the phrase, it's the year 2000 X, where is my flying car? Um, and in fact, if you type that into Google, it will auto-complete that search. Um, but I'm really proud to say that this is actually, this isn't a science fiction or a fantasy um, uh, depiction. This is actually, in fact, a flying car. It was released by the company, developed by the company Terrafusia, developed at MIT. Um, they made some significant headways last year, got some uh, clearance from the FAA, and they hope to hit commercialization and start selling their hybrid fly flying car, which is as good on the highways as, is it, as it is on the air in the next two to three years. Why am I showing this as the first slide? Just to get you to think really big and help you understand that nothing is quite as daunting or as impossible as it seems. So, what are we gonna talk about over the next 40 minutes or so? First of all, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more, more about myself and my own background, um, tell you about the company that I started and the the path we took to get there, the considerations that we had going into the project, what came up along the way. Um, from there, we're gonna move on into key lessons learned, and that's where I'd like to focus the bulk of the lecture today um, on what entrepreneurship means. Um, why is it important? Why, what does that mean in terms of evolution of a field, bringing ideas to fruition? Um, and I'd actually love to hear your comments after this discourse because it sounds like you all have interests or backgrounds related to this, whether it's in commercialization, whether it's in engineering and medicine. So let's start with my own background. Um, so as Kim told you a little bit about myself, fourth year medical student uh, at the University of Alberta, um, starting in neurosurgery here in July, but uh, took probably the most roundabout possible path to get there. Um, as you can see from behind me, I have affiliations in uh, quite a lot of things. So I'll start with my undergrad so we don't go to the, the uh, extreme beginning. Um, so I did my undergrad in neuroscience here, was always really, really interested in the brain. It was this kind of black box which we were starting to learn a little bit about but not that we necessarily, there were still so many unanswered questions. What, what is consciousness? Why can't we replicate it? If you are able to replicate the exact synaptic structure of an entire brain as well as all the neurochemicals within, will that give you emergence and consciousness? Why or why not? Um, and also, like a lot of students in undergraduate science, I always had medicine on my mind, and the point was always to go from point A to point B, from neuroscience to medicine to get that MD. Um, but backing up a little bit, I was also always a little bit of an ambitious kid. To give you an idea, when I was seven years old, I wanted to be the world's richest billionaire and use my wealth to, uh, to cure the world's greatest challenges, whether it was famine or war or colonizing Mars. And I thought, well, you know, maybe I need to be a little bit more, more realistic about my life's aspirations, so uh, I'd like to be the director of NASA. Um, and then I realized I wasn't American. Uh, so that kind of put a damper on things, uh, but I sort of focused my, my lo love of space into um, reading as much as I could about the, about the entire space sphere. And so, flash forward again to my fourth year of neuroscience, it's time to apply to medicine. And um, I came to realize that's actually quite a competitive process. I knew fantastic candidates left, right, and center who, for whatever reason, despite their 4.0 averages, despite their, their resumes that were 10 pages long, weren't getting in. And I thought, okay, well, you know, if that's them, I'm really in trouble and I might not get into medicine. So what, what can I be doing for the, the year if I don't get into medicine that I would be equally passionate about, um, that uh, I, would be, I would be really excited about? 
And the answer for me was space. Um, so I'd heard of something called the International Space University. It's based in Strasbourg, France. And um, they have a master's program um, that allows you to explore both the science and the technological aspects of space, as well as the policy and law and management oriented streams. So on a whim, I applied to medicine, I applied to the space university, um, got into both. And that's when I realized, you know what? Medicine is definitely in the future for me, but it can wait. Applied for a deferral and headed off to the Space University. And that was the beginning of my foray into everything but medicine. Um, so over there is where I got uh, interest in space medicine, space, uh, space physiology. I uh, did my internship at the European Astronaut Center and the Crew Medical Support Office. Um, Ended up getting an interest in space technology spin-offs and their application to medicine on Earth. Uh, wrote some papers on telemedicine. Ended up writing a book chapter on space technology spin-offs. Um, and the year before I knew it, the year was up. And I came to medicine. But I still, after that adventure in Europe, I had this hunger for wanting to know what else is out there. What is on the cutting edge of medicine? Um, how can, we, how can we go beyond the classroom and take on big challenges and big projects? And that's when I heard of this institution called Singularity University. It was based at NASA Ames in Silicon Valley down in California. And the, the link between the Space University and this new institution was that it was co-founded by two of the same people. So I thought, what the heck is this institution? Um, I, Noticed my friends on Facebook liking it one day. I'm like, okay, let's check out the page. Went to the website, saw their premise of taking the best of what we've done as humans and, um, and using uh, our technology, our advances to address the, our greatest challenges um, and using that to take on challenges in climate change and healthcare and water. And I was sold. But I'm not going to go too much into that because that's what the next several slides are about. So that's just where my, a little bit of my background is and you're going to hear more about that, okay? So moving now into the Civigard, my own company and the Singularity University story. So I brought you up to speed on how I heard about this incredible institution um, and I told you a little bit about what they're about. Uh, so the official spiel is our mission is to assemble, educate and inspire a cadre of leaders to strive to understand and facilitate the development of exponentially advancing technologies to address humanity's challenges. Or in lay speak, they asked us, how would you positively impact one billion people in 10 years using accelerating technologies? When I heard of this mission, I was sold because as, as you've no doubt gleaned from my background, I'm always this kind of big picture person who's always trying to look for the next big challenge. So, this was a brand new institution. No one knew whether it was going to succeed or fail. In 2009, it just established. No one knew what was going to come out of it. They'd established a nine-week program, which has since turned into a 10-week program. Um, they've also established uh, spin-off programs uh, for executives from four to nine days. Uh, my personal favorite, Future Med, which had its first run in last May, and then again this past February, focusing on trends, technologies, and medicine. Um, as well as a program focusing on women who are at the cutting edge. But back to my program that first year at Singularity University. What did we learn? So the program was, div uh, was segmented into three different, um, uh, three different segments. And for the first, first four weeks, we learned about accelerating and emerging trends and technologies in 10 core tracks of so policy, ethics, law, um, medicine, neuroscience, space, AI, physics. And then in the next two weeks, we're asked to step outside our own comfort zones, step outside of what we knew as experts. Um, and this is where I learned, uh, or I chose to learn about AI and computers and physics because I knew nothing about any of that. And then came the final three weeks of the program when we were asked to actually take what we learned about what was going on in the world, what our greatest challenges were, um, as well as what we learned about technology, what, what we learned about uh, latest developments in, in smartphone capacity, in social media, in uh, biotechnology, and use that to leverage these accelerating and emerging technologies to um, address these grand human challenges and to literally take on this challenge of 
impacting 1 billion people in 10 years in a positive way. So it seems a little bit daunting to be asked to change the lives of one seventh of the world's population for the better. But I would actually beg to differ a little bit and say when you're with the right people, you'd think even bigger than that and a little bit more ambitiously. So for my project, I worked with a team of nine fantastic individuals from seven countries. And we took a step back and we said, how would you positively impact seven billion people in 10 years with the right technologies? For us, after a little bit of thought, the answer became obvious. What impacts anyone, anywhere, anytime? The answer for us was natural and man-made disasters. Whether you're talking about terrorist threats in New York, whether you're talking about earthquakes in Chile and Haiti, typhoons in tropical regions or tsunamis in Japan, the need to manage the way we do disaster response is much, is much in need of innovation and change. And that's what we decided to take on during our project time. Specifically, we took fo focused on a concept called mass messaging. And for those of you who've been privy to experiencing even a test of an emergency response system, um, will have undoubtedly experienced a text message or a generic television message or a robotic voice on a landline that says, dear user, there's been an incident, beware. Um, as you can see on the screen behind me, here's our, here are actual examples of the ways uh, in which mass messaging is used today. So um, on, the, uh, on our right here, we see an emergency alert system for the county of San Mateo uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area that says, warning, there's a blizzard. Excellent. Okay, there's a blizzard. What do you do next? Where do you go? Which part of San Mateo does that affect? On the left, you see a screen capture of a Twitter feed when in uh, May of 2010, there was a terrorist threat in Times Square in New York City. Um, rather than giving out more specific information, the only thing that went up from New York City's Office of Emergency Management was uh, this Twitter feed which said that Broadway is closed between 44th and 46th Street. So that was the problem space that we looked at. In short, mass messaging was generic, um, and in addition to that, it was slow, and it was failure prone. On the flip side, we looked at emergence, emerging technologies and trends, and for us, um, two things became really evident. First of all, smartphones. They're everywhere, they're becoming more and more pervasive, pervasive more and more powerful, um, and they're, they're ubiquitous. So we asked at that point, what if a smartphone could save your life in a crisis? Additionally, we looked at the trends and the numbers of, uh, of these smartphones as well as in social media. So if you look at the screen here behind me, you can see that at the end of 2007, Twitter had maybe a little over 100,000 users. There were maybe 2 million smartphones in the US. And this is where I'd like to focus on talking about exponentiality and accelerating technologies and focus on that de definition a little bit more. And so to envision that, I'd ask you to think about taking 32 linear steps. If you do that, maybe if you start at one end of the room and you take 32 linear steps, you'll end up somewhere near this end of the room. Now what if you took 32 geometric steps? So with the first step, you took one foot step, then you took two, then you took four, then you took eight, then you took 16. You would be much, much further, probably to the moon several times and back if you, uh, if you followed a geometric sequence of 32 steps. And so that's what we mean when we refer to accelerating and exponentially increasing technologies. We mean that the, their computing power, that their ubiquity is increasing in an ex almost explosive fashion. So if you look at the numbers on the screen here behind me, you can see that in 2011, that number of 100,000 Twitter users overall had increased to over 600,000 Twitter users per day. Um, projecting these trends out a little bit further, by the end of 2015, there are projected to be more than three and a half to four billion smartphones around the world, quite a ways away from the two million that there were in 2007. So these were the, the trends that we were focusing on when we're thinking about our, our problem space. And that's when we decided to come up with the concept of emergency communications 
2.0. So what if we could come up with a concept that allowed us to move beyond mass messaging and how it was, and its slowness and its generality, um, and create a system that was location specific, near real time, really resistant to network failure, faster than other systems, and um, offered users, uh, trusted authorities, um, a way of seeing whether their, whether their messages were being received by the general public and adapting them. And this is what I t alluded to earlier. That's when we decided to ask, what if a smartphone could save your life in a crisis? So I won't go too much into the, the system architecture here, but I'll just explain briefly um, what this concept, the technology that we developed. So on the back end, we developed a system for trusted authorities, whether it's campus security and Office of Emergency Management, um, the US Dep Department of Homeland Security. And we gave them a console on which they could envision their entire area and specifically pick out points of interest, either by entering a postal code or a zip code, by delineating sp specific landmarks, or even just by using the touch screen to outline a custom area of interest. We also gave them the ability to drag and drop um, points of interest such as medical aid, shelter, food, uh, police stops. And then we used a computer algorithm to be able to divert a population towards a, a, a designated evacuation route. And then we could establish different priorities levels on different evacuation routes in order to route a population in different ways. On the user side, so for you and me with our smartphones, we created um, a system that would essentially allow you to receive a message and that, depending on where you were, would receive information specific to your circumstances. It was like having a policeman in your pocket when the need arose to say, hey user, there's been an incident. So for those of us who are sitting in CCIS today, if there was a gas leak outside the building, on your smartphone you would get a push notification that says, hey user, there's been a gas leak in the area, here's the designated evacuation route, step-by-step -step instructions, um, uh, here's a map with instructions on how to get there, and here's nearby points of interest. Um, for anyone who might be on the, way on the other side of campus, so for those medical students who might be way the heck in the university hospital, you might in fact get a push notification that says, hey user, there's been an incident nearby, stay away from CCIS, and here's actually other nearby points of interest. At the same time, onto the user side, we also um, put in other helpful features that we thought might be useful. So for example, survival, survival kits and first aid guides and, um, and uh, social media updates that allowed you to push a button that said, hey, I'm okay, and geotag the location so that your family who might be worrying about you uh, would know that, hey, my baby's okay, or hey, um, you know, they're, they're lost, or a, a basic update to their status. So I've already explained the command side a little bit, and um, we're nearing the end of this section, but I just want to talk about some of the other features of this system that we developed. Um, because one frequent question that we get is, uh, what do you do when the network fails? Because in times of crisis, especially when there's a disaster brewing, the network can and will fail. And so realizing that, we essentially designed our system to degrade gracefully, uh, realizing that, this, that failures would happen. So when the network is fully available, you get all the, all the features that I just talked about on our system. But when the network's partially available, um, data is not resilient, and so we instead switch to SMS light mode. Um, and that allows you to still get step-by-step -step directions just uh, based on uh, text messages. And when the network fails, um, you still have access to last known messages, pre-loaded pre um, and pre-cached uh, points of interest, so uh, medical, uh, medical aid, shelter that have been known ahead of time, um, as well as the information libraries such as embassies and 72-hour survival kit information that, um, that's preloaded onto your phone. So there's no perfect answer, but we're saying that we'd like people to be just a little bit more prepared if and when a disaster occurs, if and when the network fails. So that's enough about the technology. If you have questions about it, I'm happy to answer them or uh, talk more about it at length afterwards. But let's talk a little bit more about the, the, giant, 
the overall bird's eye view of entrepreneurship. And so it's not just having an idea, it's not just working with driven people, it's not just looking at resources at your disposal to, um, to develop an idea and bring it to fruition. It's also looking at, will this work? Is the market ready for it? Um, and if not, and I really still think it's a good idea, what do I do? So just looking again at the case study of what we did with Civigard, we actually had to do, look at the market research and we had to convince um, users and investors and uh, the government and customers alike that there was a need for this. Um, because everyone saw the utility of it, but they didn't necessarily see the economics of it. Um, so we looked into it a little bit and we realized that it's not just emergency resp response, but it's continuity of operations uh, in, a, in a business, in an institution. And we realized that this is, in fact, a thriving industry with a 39 billion um, uh, value of the market, of the worldwide market for continuity and uh, recovery um, that's projected to be at that level by 2015. So just to give you a recap, um, or just to sort of summarize and sort of tie up how this has come to fruition. In, shortly after our launch in 2009, we launched a pilot in the city of Maynard, Texas, a uh, city of 8,000 people, launched our system there. Uh, we were covered by BBC Focus, Inc. Magazine. We've since talked to the UN uh, members of, members of Google, Google.org. Um, we have uh, actually uh, been named in Entrepreneur Magazine as 100 brilliant companies to watch. And now we've actually said, hey, here's our technology. It's really exciting. We hope you're excited about it too. And now we've gone back into develop our 2.0 version. So that's going to be projected for this year. Uh, most excitingly, and what I'm going to talk about in the next session, is the need to adapt and to work quickly and to come up with things at a moment's notice. So when the whole Hurricane Irene's uh, situation broke through at the uh, end of August of last year, we realized that um, we really want to do something to help. Our CEO is from New York, he lives there and it has a special place in his heart. So what we initially tried to do was contact the New York City Office of Emergency Management and say, hey, we have this system here that could really help you manage your system, tell you who to evacuate, tell you who to leave in place, um, and it would, really, um, it, it would really help you manage the situation. Understandably, they were already swamped with calls from civilians trying to manage which population needed to be alerted as to what, um, and we weren't able to contact them. So that's when we said, you know what, why don't we break the rules, skip levels, and release something directly for civilians. So in the space of seven hours, we created a Hurricane Irene app um, that would basically allow you to figure out what your position was on Google Maps, and then based on that, say, do you need to evacuate or are you safe? So. Luckily, I was on the West Coast at the time. I was in Silicon Valley, and if you can squint and see, it says you're in Silicon Valley. You do not need to evacuate because the coast is, that's affected is in New York. Um, and just as a little addendum to that, in December of this past year, we actually won uh, the GovFresh App of the Year Award for, for our work. So that was really exciting for us. So now that you've had this case study in mind, I just want to take a step further and look at it from, from a a bit of a meta view and say, look at the lessons um, and look at what it takes to turn an idea into reality. Um, and so this third section of my talk is called lessons. And we're gonna focus on three key aspects. Uh, first, we're gonna focus on um, individuals. What kind of mindset does it take to, to really overcome this fear or these hurdles or even, even turn an idea into reality? We're going to look at environments that really foster this, uh, that are really conducive to fostering um, an entrepreneurial environment, and uh, what kind of things catalyze, catalyze the process of bringing an idea into fruition. Um, and though for those of you who are science geeks, which I suspect are many of us in this room, you will recognize the, uh, the activation energy curve and the value of a catalyst and how much that can speed up a, a reaction. So for those of you who have seen my TEDx Edmonton talk, uh, you'll know that uh, this is something I'm really, really a fan of, um, much to the chagrin of parents and of four-year-old kids. What I tell people is question everything. Do not take anything for granted. Um, because it's so easy when you're in the same environment every single day 
to just take things at face value and say, okay, you know, if, even if this is inconvenient, we'll deal with it, you know? Even if this is kind of a pain to deal with, you know, it's just part of my surroundings and nothing can change. Um, and I would say, look at the mundane and ask, why not? You know, why does it have to be like this? Um, so, the two things you see on the screen here behind me are the Heinz ketchup bottle at a public restroom. Um, and so, why do we have Heinz ketchup bottles? Anyone who's ever tried to pour ketchup from the bottle will realize that it's probably the most inefficient design ever. Um, what kind of product, by its very design, would not allow you to access the full amount of of uh, product there and that's meant to be used. So that's my little rant against Heinz ketchup bottles. On the flip side, public restrooms drive me nuts, and as I suspect many of you who are germaphobes will drive you nuts as well. In any given public restroom these days, you'll see maybe an automatically flushing toilet or automatic lights or automatic soap or automatic taps. But it's maybe one in a hundred public restrooms in which you'll actually see the full set of automated everything from toilet to taps to soap dispensers to dryers. And when you think about germs tra germ transmission, especially in the context of pandemics and flu outbreaks from H1N1 to swine flu to SARS, it actually becomes really important. And so my question to anyone out there is, why don't we have more fully automated public bathrooms? Just taking this question everything mindset um, a little bit further, seek out Christ-attunities. And what I mean by that, um, to borrow a Simpsons term, is realize that crises are crises because there's a better way to manage them that we just haven't found yet. And so looking at what we did with Civigard, we weren't trying to exploit disasters or the, the chaos that ensued. We said, you know, how can we, how can we do this better? Um, and then the other corollary here when you're questioning everything and when you're looking at how things can be done better is think big, think really, really big. So I told you about what the end product of what we've de developed looks like, but I didn't tell you about the story leading up to it. I didn't tell you about how in the three weeks and 20 hours a day, seven days a week, we were constantly prototyping, not sleeping, looking at every aspect of disaster response. So our initial, our initial set of solutions was everything from uh, relief delivery to uh, AI physicians to uh, field kits that would help manage mass casualties. And then we looked at, you know, of all our solutions, what is the here now, what's the most viable? That's how we thought big in the context of disaster response. But I'd just like to reiterate the point that this isn't something that's only that's, that only we did. I think it's something that's ingrained in people who have a desire to change things and not really listen to the rules or what the conventional wisdom would say. Um, so the question I would pose to you is, what is the most crazy, far out, fairy tale, disruptive idea you can think of? And just to tell you, to, talk, to maybe inspire you a little bit, to get you thinking a little bit, I'd like to point out some, some technologies and some companies that are, in, uh, that are being developed today. So in the same year that we developed Civigard, there was another team project called Akasa, and they focused on 3D printing, which is exactly what it sounds like. You input the parameters, you input the basic materials, and then you can print whatever it is that, you, that you're aiming to. So in their case, they thought, you know, what if we could print houses? What if we could focus on those who are impoverished and who cannot afford the time and the amount of money and the waste that it takes to build a house, and what if we could use a 3D printer to build a shelter? And through their research, they found in 70% less waste, 70% less time, um, and for far less cost, in two days, you could print, you could print a house with native materials. So if you're, if you're in somewhere far more hot um, and far more arid, you could use local materials like clay and adobe. And they're still working on the solution. The only limiting factor they have now is to figure out how they can go beyond building walls beyond six feet high. They've also, the field of 3D printing has in fact even expanded beyond this. Um, 
there's startups now, both in Boston and Harvard, at the MIT area, as in Silicon Valley and across the world that are focusing on 3D printing of tissues. This is a really fascinating concept because right now, for those of us in the medical field um, who've had the chance to look a little bit more closely at the scenario of, of tissue donations and tissue transplants, really realize to what extent it is that uh, donors are a rate limiting step. How many people die every single year waiting for a liver transplant, waiting for a heart transplant, or knowing that there are these organs out there, but they're not compatible with the patient's own, um, with the patient's own tissues? What if you could input the basic printing material, cells in this case, of whatever organ or tissue it is that you wanted to print? And what if you could set out the parameters and say, I have a patient that needs a heart transplant stat, let's print a heart. There are people out there today who are saying, why not, and who are actively working on this. The last thing I'll say about 3D printing is that we have just began to explore the tip of the iceberg in this field. There are those out there who say that what happens when 3D printing and nanotechnology come together as fields? And what if we say that what happens when we, we slam together two hydrogen molecules and one oxygen and we print water? Water would no longer be a scarce resource. Now what if you could take that and extrapolate that to, to food, to shelter as we've seen, to tissues? This is what exactly what Kim was talking about in the, in, the, in the introduction of our course today when he talked about abundance. And this is what uh, Peter Diamandis, the author of that book, says when, he's, so when he refers to the future as being much more, much more better, much, much uh, less bleak than we think. The last company I want to talk about on the slide is Halcyon Molecular. They were really interesting, uh, interested in the field of biotechnology. Um, specifically, they wanted to move beyond gene sequencing to gene synthesis. Um, and they asked, you know, if it's, if it's broken genes um, that cause disease, a lot of our diseases that are responsible for aging, why don't we focus on that problem? Because what happens when we can over, not only master gene sequencing, um, but learn to write our own, our own gene codes? We could essentially overcome disease and they said in, a, in one moment of frenzy, they said, what if we could overcome aging? Then no one would ever have to die. What if we didn't have to die? Now, if you're like me, I would have thought that was a certainty like taxes. But there's people out there who are just asking, what if every single day? So I talked about this a little bit earlier. I talked about exponential trends. And I asked you to engage in that thought experiment of 32 linear steps versus 32 geometric steps. Just to take that to a real world example, I talked about smartphones already, but let's look at media, um, conventional media, social media. So 50 years ago, when we looked at the radio, it took 38 years to reach 50 million people. 38 years, that's almost four decades. By contrast, look at the explosion of Facebook since 2006. It took Facebook two years to reach 50 million people. The next thing I want to say about mindsets is be resourceful. What currencies do we trade in right now? Money is the obvious one that leaps to mind. I would posit that there is much more out there for anyone who's willing to think about it. In academia, publications, grants, those are a very, uh, very legitimate form of currencies that we trade in. Um, as we're seeing with social media, networks are becoming increasingly valuable because of the, of the value that they provide, because of the information, because of the connections. And so what if we engaged in this thought experiment where we talked about 3D printing and abundance and the, and the banishment of, of scarcity? Um, and so we never had to worry about resource limitation. We never had to worry about having enough money. How, what, what do our currencies become then? What is it that's unique to each and every person? It's creativity. It's, it's uh, creativity, it's uh, synthesis, it's information, it's individuality. I would posit, in fact, that creativity is what makes us as unique as a species as we are, that it's the paragon of our achievement. 
So the next thing I want to say about mindsets is be goal-driven. So I talked a little bit about how to synthesize ideas, how to foster creativity, how to get yourself rolling on brainstorming and thinking about an idea you want to develop in the first place. Now let's, I want to bring this a little bit back more to reality and talk about what it takes to go from an idea to something that's actually marketable. Um, and so technology does not equal viability. You have to think about your idea in the context of the world today. Let's look at the evolution of the video phone. Sure, it's doing reasonably well with FaceTime on the iPhone today, but we've had video phones since 1970, but we've not lived in this Jetsonian type, type of environment where we phone, um, we phone our neighbor up and we're, we're you know, chatting via video. That hasn't, the technology's been around for decades, but it hasn't taken off till now with things like Skype, till things with FaceTime. So once you have a product, you need to think about how is it going to fare um, in the context of the market? What will drive adoption? Uh, what incentivizes people to want to adopt a technology? Um, and how will you man maximize your chances of your product being adopted? So the two people on the slide here behind me, one of them is Peter, uh, Peter Diamandis, who was the one who authored this book called Abundance and co-founded the, the Space University and Singularity University. And then the, the gentleman on the uh, right over there is Don Jones of Qualcomm. Um, and he's responsible for developing products in life sciences um, and in healthcare and wireless sensor technology. And I once asked him, how do you know what motivates people? He told me about some of the really cool technologies that they were developing at Qualcomm. He told me about a, a, a prescription bottle that has a sensor in its cap that can let, that counts every time you take your, your pill, that beeps every time you, uh, you take your medication, uh, that beeps when it, your prescription is getting low, that can automatically send a message to your pharmacy when you need a refill. And I asked him, but how do you ensure that people are going to adopt this? And he told me that throughout his years and years of experience, he's come to uh, realize that there's certain factors which motivate people. Peter has a, a very similar list. And I'm sure if you even think about what it is that motivate people, you'll come up with your own list. It's pretty obvious. I mean, if something's fun, people are going to want to play it. Why the heck do people play Farmville on Facebook? Um, fear is a great motivator. Sex is a great motivator. If this, something makes life more convenient, uh, if something makes life more safe, uh, if you can have personal pride in something, if there's financial incentive, um, if there's an element of power, that goes back to very Darwinian roots, you know? It's essentially coming back to helping you survive. Um, so when you're thinking about an idea in the context of reality, think about, and you want to, you believe it really has legs, then think about what it is that will motivate people to feel the exact same way and want to use your product. So that's the last of what I'm going to say on mindsets. Let's switch tracks a little bit now to environments. So I know I've been talking at you for quite a little bit of time, so I'm just going to turn it over to you and just, just shout it out right now. What kind of environments do you think would foster um, entrepreneurship or daring or innovation? I think there was a nick at the back, is that right? Um, I think sometimes I think about like bringing different fields together. So maybe a place where people from all different fields can get together and discuss things, because sometimes a solution has been developed in one area and it's equally applicable in another area. It's not very specific, but... I just want to say, if I had $10 million, I would give it to you right now, because you've hit it exactly on the nail. Um, any other ideas? Anyone? Probably an environment of comp like that fosters competition as well. Um, just thinking about like when you think back about in the history, say of space races or races during wartime, um, has always fostered new innovations that have been used outside of that arena as well. So I think when you have people comp competing for a common goal, brilliant, yeah, it brings out a lot of different. That's that's ideas. exactly it. Um, so for those of uh, those of you who didn't hear, the comment was uh, competition. And so, for those of you who may have heard of this organization called the XPRIZE Foundation, um, again, created by Peter Diamandis, um, his whole 
premise was that when you look at when you looked at uh, Lindbergh and what fostered his flight around the world, it was a prize for cash. Um, and he thought, let's, that's a brilliant concept. Co cooperation um, isn't nearly as good as competition when it comes to incentivizing people. And that's the concept, that's the mindset that he went, uh, that d drove forward the 2004 uh, Ansari X Prize and uh, the race to become the first private suborbital uh, company uh, that could achieve suborbital flight. Um, it's what drove uh, the Virgin Galactic to build Spaceship One, achieve uh, suborbital flight, and win the Ansari X Prize. So when you're talking about environments, there's a host of factors that would actually drive, um, drive in inventiveness and disruption. And one of them that I'd like to focus on now is uh, environments of constraint. Because for the longest time, it never really made sense to me why we in Canada, um, being as resource, resource rich, as brain power rich, um, and as in such a stable society as we are, uh, aren't more willing to take risks. Um, at the same time, uh, this is around circa 2009, again, when I was at Singularity, I happened to meet a lot of Israelis. And it just boggled my mind by how they were all very, very sharp. They were very intellectual. They always asked pointed questions. And so finally, I sat down with one of them who happened to be the advisor to the president. And I said, how, do you, how is it that every single Israeli that I've met is so intelligent? And he said, when you look at the geography of Israel, when you look at how landlocked we are, how tiny we are, and how much we've had to defend ourselves throughout the ages, we have nothing but our wits to rely on to survive. And because of that, we have to innovate. And that's why you see us asking so many questions. That's why you see us, um, that's why you see us innovating so much. Um, I thought, well, maybe, maybe that's a, an exception. Maybe, maybe that's, that's just you guys. And then I happened to be in Singapore um, in November, and I saw the same thing again. Again, a very tiny little country, um, not landlocked in this case, uh, but rather surrounded by water, uh, but very, very resource limited. They import so much of their water and their food, yet it's a hub of innovation. Why? because they have to in order to survive. If they just lived on what they had, they would be at the end of the resources in no time flat. But on the other end of the spectrum, let's look at Silicon Valley. They are by no means resource limited, by no means constrained by finance, um, by no means in an unstable or war-torn uh, area where they need to defend themselves. So what is it that drives Silicon Valley? It's the desire to be their own disruptive force because it goes back to this mindset of saying, okay, well, this is the world around us, but what if it could be different? How can I disrupt this? How can it be, how can it be something that's the exact opposite of what it is? Um, and when you, if you were ever to go down there, you would realize that that's very much the mindset in which everyone operates. It's kind of like Disneyland for smart people because they're always asking, you know, what's the next step and how can we disrupt? And so the last thing I'll say on that subject, um, just alluding again to Silicon Valley, is that anywhere you have stasis and stability, you won't have startups. And that's what the common link is between places like Singapore and Israel and Silicon Valley. Okay. Um, so we're just going to jump back to mindsets for a second here. And we're going to talk about what it is that characterize an entrepreneur. When you think of people like Steve Jobs, when you think of Larry Page and Sergey Brin of Google, when you think of uh, Richard Branson, what is it that leaps to mind? Some people would say crazy, um, which is for better, which may or may not be true. Um, but there's been extensive studies, um, Harvard Business Review, Inc. Magazine, entrepreneur.com, uh, friends of mine put together something called the Startup Genome where they extensively polled and researched and extrapolated traits and trends of startups. And they looked at what is it that, that uh, entrepreneurs tend to 
people who start up their own companies, who step, step outside of that nine to five job or out of a safe environment, what is it that tends to drive them? And they happen to be the ones who are not risk averse, the ones who may be borderline um, psyche on a psychiatric condition, uh, that are hypomanic, obsessive, driven. Um, in terms of what they do, they're the ones who seize opportunities, um, who'll, who always have a backup plan. Um, and if that backup plan fails, we'll turn around at a moment's notice. Um, and even when something isn't going their way, they'll persevere, persevere, persevere to the end. Um, even if it means that they're semi-delusional and the world around them is saying it can't be done. So the last thing I want to say about um, mindset is ignore excuses. I know there's so many of us out there they say things like, oh, you know what, but I'm, I'm too young, or I'm too old, I don't have the experience, or I'm too set in my job, or I have a family, or what if I fail, or you know what, I have this great job with this great title right now, um, so you know what, why would I give that all up, or I don't know if I can take on the title of CEO because it's so much responsibility, or I don't have the skills, or I don't have the ideas. But I'd just like you to pause and sort of reflect on what we've been talking about for the past 40 minutes. Um, it is that ideas are always around you, and they're in the people around you, and they're in the environments around you. And I actually just want to go back to what Nick said about uh, cross-disciplinary uh, uh, binding and thinking and interaction. Because if you look at the greatest innovations, whether it's in, in co computation or search engines or social networks or in cars, it takes a whole whack of people. It takes engineers, it takes business development people, it takes thinkers, it takes doers. And so you're never ever going to get anywhere if you just think that I need to keep this idea to myself. You really need to find people who are as passionate about your idea as you are um, and who will complement your skill set. So for me, who's a total non-techie, who um, knows very little about coding, was still able to do something in the computer, in the uh, smartphone and computational sphere because my co-founder and CEO was a seasoned entrepreneur who had built and coded for nearly all his life. Okay. So just to summarize, what is it that guides innovation? It's, as Homer Simpson would say, crisis Um It's looking at what will motivate yourself as an entrepreneur and motivate people to use your product. It's wealth creation. It's, wanting, it's getting out of the cycle of stasis and stability and pursuing disruption. Um, and I'd like to take a minute to focus on this term called accurate contrarian theorists, which I had never heard of until Kim brought it up to me. Um, and it's a term used by Reid Hoffman, founder of LinkedIn, that says, you know what, if an idea is crazy um, and everyone says it can't be done, who cares? Look for that one person who says it can't done, can't, or it can be done. And who has a legitimate idea of getting to this crazy idea, that sole contrarian, and pursue him, and that's actually how he invests. Um, when you're trying to pursue innovation, look for inefficiencies in the system. I mean, look at air travel today. Look at the time that you need to check into an airport, the time you need to go through security lines, the time it takes to get on an airplane, to get off an airplane. That entire industry is waiting and begging to be revolutionized. And the more you fly, the more you'll see it. And you can either be impatient about it, or you can think about ideas to change that. And as I've said time and time again, think exponentially, look at trends around you, read the technology section, read the business section of the newspaper, and pay a little bit more attention to what it is that's up and coming and how much it's being adopted. So that's the real end of mindsets. Um, and now we're going to go back to that errant slide in environments. So we talked a little bit about constraints and how they foster environments. Um, and now we're just going to talk about the importance of being cross-disciplinary. And I've talked about it mostly right now. Um, but I just want to focus on the importance of teams. So the people you see behind in that, in that picture behind me doing the crazy X's was the founding team of Civic Art, nine people from seven countries. We had Poland, we had Russia, we had India, we had USA, Canada, we had software engineers, we had business people, inventors. Um, and the importance of having a team in so many disciplines 
is the same as having, is the same as looking at a network or a set of neurons, a network of neurons. If you have one neuron, it's completely useless on its own. It's when it starts to communicate to the next neuron that, uh, that something happens, that information is communicated. And what if you were to add two more neurons or four more neurons? You would suddenly have all these different conversations happening at once. And that's where emergence happens. That's where consciousness happens. And it's the same thing when you have a team of different people with different mindsets and different disciplines. When you foster all that crosstalk, that is when you have brilliant ideas coming to fruition. That's when you have people saying, okay, you know what? It looks crazy. It sounds crazy, but it can be done. So now going to the nitty gritty of it, when you're trying to, <laughs> um, I actually love this photo because it's, uh, it's a hands-free telephone. I mean, it's not a beautiful product, it's not perfect, but it's quick and dirty and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the first example of, you know, something that might be a Bluetooth later on. So if you're trying to develop something but you're worried that it's not beautiful or that it's not perfect, Forget about aiming for per perfection. Go for that minimal viable product. Go for what's good enough. Um, and then iterate from there on. Because if you try to go from, from Edmonton to China in a single day, it's going to be way too daunting. It's, you're not going to be able to convince yourself that it can be done. But if you take, look at your thousand step journey and your master plan, for us in Civic Guard, we wanted to take on the whole sphere of disaster response. And we focused, we narrowed, gradually narrowed down. We looked at the whole sphere of disaster response from relief develop, de delivery to mass messaging. And then we said, okay, we're gonna focus on the sphere. So this kind of, again, is a throwback to mindsets and the importance of brainstorming and generating as many ideas as possible and not throwing anything out. And then from there, you have a thousand ideas, you cycle down, or you have one product and you say, okay, this is quick and dirty, how do I make it better? So the last thing I'm going to say about environments is the importance of not being daunted by failure. One of the, my favorite quotes that I've ever heard is by Dean Kamen, who invented the insulin pump and a lot more fun, the Segway. And he once said that you're going to have to kiss a lot of frogs. Um, keep kissing frogs. You might get some warts, but once in a while you'll find your prince or princess. And so. I think one of the most important things um, if you're trying to develop a project or a company or a technology is overcoming the stigma, stigma of failure and not, saying, not being daunted by it. Um, because there's no such thing as a real failure as long as you're learning what not to do next time or what to do better next time. That's not to say go into it heads down, crazy, not looking at any of the realities of the world around you. It means having a backup plan, being ready to adapt and flip your product, um, being, uh, being aware of the importance of risk mitigation, looking at you know, team members who can complement your weaknesses, looking at markets that might actually um, buy your product. And so just to bring this abstract concept a little bit more close to home, for example, with us at Civigard, we thought, you know, we have this great product, governments will be all over it, uh, it's really important, they need to talk to their civilians and their populations in a time of crisis. Um, and so we went to the local government, the state government, the federal government, and they were really excited about it. But there's no money for it, um, especially nowadays with the economy the way it is. Uh, when it comes to grant cycles, disaster response isn't the first thing that everyone wakes up thinking about every morning. So then we pivoted and we looked at, well, who else has a need for security? Academic institutions do. Major corporations do. Nokia has over 100,000 employees around the globe, and when we talked to them about this, they said, this is brilliant, because when the whole Iceland volcano, volcano incident went, went down, we had people stranded in London, in New York, and we just lost so much money trying to figure out who should come into work, who was still able to work, trying to coordinate. So it means that being aware of the need to pivot and look at other opportunities um, it doesn't mean that one dead end is necessarily the end all be all. So we're nearing the end of this section and I just want to summarize on the lessons and the pearls that um, we've talked about today. So how do you start getting an idea? Um, 
say you're a creative person, but you've never really done anything like this before. Say you've never started up a club or a cause or a company. Just brainstorm. Um, and if you feel that it's too wide and it's too, if your problem space is too wide, um, go back to the environmental importance of constraints. Give yourself a set of uh, boundaries that will force you to think a little bit more differently, a little bit more outside the box. Related to that, brainstorm like mad, because at first all ideas are good ideas, because all you're trying to do is go for volume. Question everything, ask questions about things you don't understand, ask questions about people that might be in fields you've never understood before. Inform yourselves. I said to read the technology and the business sections of the paper. If you're a tech and business person, read the medical section of a paper. You know, pick up a journal of nature and try to wade through the, wade through the, uh, the scientific mess of, of uh, terminology and try to, uh, try to get yourself thinking in a completely different mind frame. Um, leverage your team and resources. Because you, as a single person, are never going to be that brain surgeon and that rocket scientist and that dancer and that musician all at once. That's why we have seven billion people on this planet to complement each other and to fill in each other's gaps and weaknesses and to synergize and come up with ideas that are so much greater than ourselves. So work in teams. Work in teams outside your own disciplines. Work in people outside, with people who have a completely different skill set outside of you and see what you can build together. Ask big pie in the sky fairy tale questions. Start big, start dirty, then iterate quickly. Come up with that hands free phone that's just a rubber band around your head and then iterate down. Come up with something a little bit better next time and eventually get your weight down to a Bluetooth. Um, don't be daunted by failure because it's not failure as much as you, as long as you choose to learn from it uh, and as long as you choose to keep on that track. So you need to pers persevere, you need to obsess, you need to repeat. Um, I mean, if you look at the number of times that Richard Branson failed and the amount of money he lost. It's been in the billions. Sure, he's reached uh, success with initially with Virgin Records and now with Virgin Media, but he had to lose so many billions of dollars and close down many of his companies before he could end, end that point. Pointing again to Peter, who also launched Zero G Ventures, which is commercial parabolic flights for anyone who wants to uh, experience Zero G. He said that was an 11-year startup. He finally did it, but it took over a decade. Don't be afraid to field test. Do your market testing. If, you have, if you've developed something, who cares if it's not perfectly packaged? Do you want to know if that there's a demand for it? And if there's not, why not? And how do you motivate people to want what you're developing? And if they're not, if they're not interested in it, how can you pivot? Um, pivot PRN. PRN is a medical term for as needed or when needed. So, Redesign, shift your thinking, look at things from a different angle when, when, people are, when people don't seem to be taking to your new idea. And of course, be audacious and have a plan B. You always have to be more than a little bit daring. Um, I've pointed out that Civigard Hurricane Irene app. That was done in the space of seven hours and we had no expectations other than it might help a few people. And it went a long way and it received um, a lot of uh, accolades from technological gurus. You have to scare yourself. You have to take the road less traveled. Um, if I hadn't taken a four-year medical degree and turned it into at least a six-year degree so far, I don't think I would be where I am today. Um, remember that money isn't the only currency. I talked about the importance of trading and information and creativity, looking at the value of networks. Um, and just to point out one last uh, example, uh, when we were bootstrapping our startup and I was living in Silicon Valley, which is an incredibly expensive place, um, I still built up my, net list of, my list of contacts and networks by going to conferences. Um, and some days I would be in conferences four in a row and people ask, how can you afford to go to these conferences and meet these people who will give you the media coverage or who will make these contacts? And it was leveraging my social media um, worth and my credibility and saying that, you know what, I've done social media for this major conference. Can I do the social media for your conference um, and publicize it and in exchange come to your conference for free? And in doing so, we managed to uh, land uh, media coverage with uh, some of the biggest technology blogs and publications out there. 
I've already said this a little bit when I was talking about teamwork, but I can't stress this enough, that you have to be surrounded by good people, um, ones who are willing to work hard, who are willing to ask hard questions and to think outside the box. You have to inspire each other and you have to seek to be inspired. Uh, don't go for the traditional carrots or the, the golden, the golden um, you know, traditions of titles and awards and accolades and scholarships. Um, I think a lot of us in medicine or, or in research are particularly prey to this because we trade in, you know, how much is, you're only as good as your last publication or, you know, how thick is your resume. But if you push that aside, even as an experiment for a month or two and don't apply for that next scholarship and just say, what is it that I want to do? What is it that I'm trying to develop? You'll be surprised at how far you're actually, um, you'll actually come. The last thing I want to say is, Put yourself out there. If you have an idea, for example, you want to develop the next Facebook, you think it's a really good idea and you think it's viable, then put yourself out there. Go to social media conferences. Find out people who've been there, done that. Find out people who've tried to develop it. Just educate yourself. Meet people. So in the last five minutes, I'm just going to talk about trends on the horizon um, and maybe leave you with a few thoughts that might inspire you and uh, might Focus, focus your own thoughts or cause you to brainstorm a little bit. So let's talk about trends in medicine. There's an institute in Seattle that has come up with the 4P paradigm, which is now wild, widely used, especially in the United States. And they talk about trends in medicine converging towards uh, participatory, preventative, predictive, and personalized medicine. Which makes a lot of sense when you think about it. So for, focusing, for example, on personalized medicine. When you look at the body of evidence-based medicine that's out there, and you look at the success rates of a particular new drug or treatment, um, and you say, realize that, oh, okay, it's been applicable for this section of the population. Um, the odds that you're going to be in the same population in every single research trial or treatment that's out there, that you're going to fall within that one standard deviation of the bell curve that is always, that that treatment always works for, is infinitesimally small. There's going to be at least one treatment or drug that's not going to apply to you because of your genetics or because of your, of your metabolism or because of the way you've evolved or developed. And so that's why there's a need to personalize our, our medications and our treatments. And one of my favorite examples of this is breast cancer therapy and uh, looking at uh, selective estrogen-related um, receptors um, and modulators. Uh, because there are certain types of cancers out there that are responsive to dr drugs because of the receptors that they demonstrate on the cancer cell surfaces. And there's certain patient populations and certain groups that will respond to treatments while others won't. Um, when you look at uh, nutrition, for example, there's people who will become anemic very, very quickly due to the way they metabolize iron or due to the way that, due to their gender. And so there's a need to really tailor our med our, the way we do medicine today. And that's why, um, that's why sites like uh, Patients Like Me have sprung up where patients can, you know, detail their profile and detail their, uh, detail their own, uh, demographic and how they've, how they've dealt with an illness. Um, that's why things like 23andMe are out there, which is personalized genetics, where with, by giving yourself a spit swab and sending, away your, sending it away, you can actually get your own personalized genotype or your personalized genome results and uh, find out, you know, am I more or less likely to develop diabetes? Am I more or less likely to uh, develop a, a venous thromboembolism? Uh, am I more, uh, am I a, a, an endurance runner or am I a sprint runner? Um, and, and right now, things like these are just on the, on the cusp of becoming popularized. They're interesting. But now is where things get interesting because we look for, we look for use cases. Um, we look for ways in which we can actually bring this to practical medicine. So the other things I want to mention that are specific to medicine um, in terms of emerging technologies and trends, um, basically, in a single phrase, faster, better, cheaper, smaller, more portable. So 
We asked earlier with CivigGuard, what if a smartphone could save your life in a crisis? What if your smartphone could be your doctor? The XPRIZE Challenge launched in uh, January uh, in conjunction with Qualcomm at the Consumer Electronics Show, the Tricorder Challenge. For anyone who's a Trekkie here, uh, you'll know, <laughs> see a couple hands go up. For anyone who's a Trekkie, you'll know that the Tricorder is this amazing little handheld device that can scan a patient without even touching them and immediately come up with a diagnosis. And people at XPRIZE said, hey, why not? Why isn't that possible? Um, and there's people actually out there vying for this challenge. The Scanadu is one of the companies that's uh, based in, in, in California who are trying to build something that can, uh, without touching a patient, without sampling a patient, uh, just based on history and based on uh, visual presentation, can come up with a reasonable differential diagnos diagnosis that would help a physician make, make a, re uh, a relevant decision. For those of you who are following the progress of IBM's Watson, um, this was the computer that went on Jeopardy last year and actually won against reigning human champions because the AI and the language processing was so good that it managed to, to parse through complex questions and riddles and most of the time uh, understand what was being asked of it as an inanimate object and still do well enough to beat previous champions. So what happens when you take something like Watson and bring it into medicine? Right now, I know that the next destination of Watson this week is being billed as Wall Street. What happens when you put a powerful, uh, artificially intelligent processor like that and look at trends in economics and business and trading? Um, just to focus on the other uh, aspects of medicine, uh, I want to talk about faster, better, cheaper. Um, and specifically focus on uh, things that are kind of fairy tales right now, but may not be in 10 years' time. I know DARPA, one branch, the experimental branch of the military, is developing respirocytes, which are mechanical blood cells, which would ideally be better than red blood cells and allow patients to breathe for minutes or even hours underwater at a time. And this is just within medicine. What is still left on the horizon? Personal transfer is begging to be redesigned. Why don't we have a flying car yet? It's coming from what we've seen. Agriculture, our land resources aren't finite. Um, clean water is becoming an increasingly scarce resource. And there's those out there who think that the next world war will be fought over clean water and access to it. Food production, access to health care, green energy that's renewable and sustainable and that won't pollute our planet or change our climate. So in parting, the questions I want to ask you to get you thinking is, who will be the first person to walk on Mars? How, how and when will we achieve our next extra, our first extraterrestrial settlement? Are we going to be the last generation to die? Or are we going to be the first to achieve immortality? Is it possible to further the field of 3D printing to master to gain mastery of the molecules themselves and in doing so overcome scarcity forever. Can we reverse engineer the brain? Will that actually work or is, are we more than the sum of, a par of our parts and is emergence a myth? And of course, my favorite question, is neuroplastic surgery a viable field? Is it possible to take stem cells, inject it into your frontal lobe and suddenly have better executive functioning and reasoning powers? There are times when I wish that was true. So in closing, when you leave here today, for those of you who want to take this further, I'd encourage you to ask those pie in the sky, fairy tale, what if questions. To quote, quote Steve Jobs, stay hungry, stay foolish, because today's craziness, craziness might be tomorrow's breakthrough. To quote Dean Kamen, when embarking on an idea, ask yourself, is it crazy? The answer should be yes. If it works, will it be a very big deal? This is how Dean Kamen told me that he plans his next project. If it's not, then he doesn't. To quote George Bernard Shaw, look at the world and don't think why, ask why not? Because progress does not depend on the unquestioning individual, but the unreasonable one who conforms the world toward himself. 
So it's 2012, we're inching nearer to our flying cars. And with that, I'll leave you and ask and entertain any questions you might have. My contact information is up there, my Twitter, my uh, email address. Um, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> we're we're uh, out of time.